I am on the line right now with Stu Bennett, who is starring in the new film, I Am Vengeance, Retaliation. It's out this Friday. Stu, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, so where are you located now? I live in Los Angeles these days. So uh, yeah, I've been stuck here for about four months like everyone else right now. So everything's going a little quiet, but finally the film is out. So excited to talk about yeah, that. So you have something to look forward to this week. You are returning to the role of Special Forces soldier John Gold. And I just got a chance to watch the movie. It's, uh, I guess, it's not a rescue mission. It's, you know, more like it's, a... It's a vengeance mission. It, it's a revenge film, you, you know, uh-huh. seeking justice. It's very fast-paced, and there's a lot of, coo- you know, there's a lot of co- cool moves, surprises, a lot of physical work. Uh, how does How does that... A- appeal to you as not only a guy that came from a fighting background, but as a wrestler? Yeah. I mean, I think the obvious transition for any professional wrestler who wants to move to the acting world in any capacity is action uh, by virtue of the fact that we're very action packed people and we come from an action packed discipline. So um, there's definitely an appeal in that world. I love doing that. I love being physical still, even though people aren't watching me wrestling at this point in time. Um, I love the fact that I get to work with, Directors and actors who are very much about storylines and narratives, but also um, very much about the physicality and the stunts and all that kind of stuff too. And I grew up in the 80s. Uh, I was born in 1980. So I'm a fan of this genre of film. And I grew up, to me, growing up, film stars were Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, Dolph Lundgren, and people like that. So to be able to create a movie that's kind of an ode to those 80s action classics um, from that era is, is pretty cool for me and um, yeah, really enjoyed doing it. And it, it is pretty cool seeing like a revival of sorts of that style movie because for a while it was like, and I enjoy them just as much, but like the transporter and you know, that like over the top sort of, you know, like caper style movie. And it's nice to see like, you know, close shots fighting you know you're getting to use guns a lot and uh one of the people that stars in the movie with you vinnie jones is a really good actor he's been in a lot of very good stuff like snatch and uh the condemned with uh steve austin so you know what was it like working with him yeah i loved working with vinnie and um my kind of fandom of Vinnie Jones goes all the way back to the 80s when he was a soccer player in the UK, which um, he was notorious for being the bad guy and kind of fouling people and being the hard man of soccer. Uh, But I'm also a huge fan of his acting career too. And I think there are certain parallels when I look at his transition from the world of soccer moving into film. I think it kind of uh, echoes my own attempts to kind of move from pro wrestling to do a bit of acting too. Um, So, you know, it's great to work with him. He's an amazing performer. He's a big name. Um, and he also, this was his 100th movie that he shot. So uh, he brought a level of knowledge to the film set that really helped us all. It helped me with my acting. It helped Ross Boyas, the director, with some of his shots and the, the camera guys. And uh, to get that level of knowledge for free built into the appearance of Vinnie Jones in the film is, is fantastic. Wow. I, I didn't know he's been in that movie, many movies. I remember, I think it was Gone and Sis. Gone, excuse me, Gone in 60 Seconds was like the first time I really saw him. And, you know, he's a fantastic actor. So it's great that, you know, you kind of got to work with somebody that you looked up to in that aspect. Yeah. Of course, uh, and even like when, when we were off set, I was constantly grilling him about what was it, what was the experience like working with this actor or what about this time you played soccer in, in this stadium? How was that? You know, so I, I got to be a complete fanboy with him too when we were off set. So I got a lot out of that film. Now, as we learned about you through your WWE career, we, we learned that, you know, you have a, a physical background, a fighting background, but, you know, one of the things that was more endearing or most appealing was, you know, you were so good on the mic, you were great at cutting a promo, and does that help you, like, transition into acting despite this, you know, being such a physical movie? I think so. I think um, when I look back at my career, the periods of my career where I had the most success would have been Nexus and Bad News Barrett. And the two things that those periods had in common was that those were the periods of my career where I got the microphone the most. So I always knew that I was a capable talker. Um, I always felt that as a fan growing up, I loved the storylines, the personas, 
um, the promo work, more than probably anything else. That's what drew me in, and that's what, in a lot of cases, I think is missing in the world of pro wrestling today. It's the the lack of emphasis on those areas. So I think somebody like myself, and I do consider talking as being my biggest strength in wrestling. I think the transition into an acting kind of role is is quite natural. Um, I don't think it's um, it's a too big a jump really to tweak the performances for um film versus pro wrestling when when you're a confident talker and indeed you know you can also see the way i've moved into kind of commentating in pro wrestling and working with nwa currently and and doing commentary there that it's something i enjoy something i feel i excel in um and something i i hope to get to do a lot more of going forward you worked with world of sport for a while that's kind of where you got your start on commentary and then uh you worked with defiant before nwa and was this something that you kind of planned ahead of time that you wanted to start doing as you, you transitioned to more of an on-air personality and less of an in-ring wrestler? Yeah, 100%. I'd say even prior to WOS, in fact, before anybody probably even knew who Wade Barrett was, I was actually a commentator in Florida Championship Wrestling in 2008 and 2009. So I was in developmental at the time, and this was a time when developmental was seen as the um the kind of red-headed stepchild of wwe and it was never mentioned and you'd never see references to us on the website or anything like that so nobody really knew what was going on down in florida apart from the people in florida who got the local networks to show uh but dusty Rhodes, who was the head of creative at the time in fcw loved the way i presented and liked the way i talked and he was always a supporter of mine and he gave me an opportunity to be the color commentator down there and he liked what he saw and he, he left me on there for I think it was the best part of a year I was commentating down there before very soon after that, the writers on WWE TV took note and were like, we like the way this guy talks. Can he wrestle? And they're like, yeah, he can wrestle. All right, get him on the show. So I was on NXT season one straight away then. Um, So that kind of took me in a different direction. Obviously, I wrestled for a long time. But in the back of my head, I always knew that when I was done in the ring, whenever that would be, um, I would want to go into commentating in some capacity or some place. And it's something to this day I love doing. I like Again, it's a a chance for me to add story and add character and add personality to what is essentially a stunt show in the ring. Um, And it allows me to tell other people's stories when I'm commentating. And that has always been the draw of pro wrestling to me above anything else. So looking back, like you mentioned FCW, NXT, it was, I mean, the only way I could describe it as a fan, it was a very weird transitional period where they, like your season of NXT was really like, the catalyst of, okay, we're doing something different, you know, with the Nexus angle and it, you know, it was unexpected, exciting. Looking back on that, like how prepared were you for that jump? Because you said you were doing commentary in FCW. It was, a devel- uh, you know, a, a developmental territory. And then you get thrown into that situation, you main event at SummerSlam, like, how prepared were you for that at that point? I'd say my, my biggest strength back then was what was always my biggest strength, which was my ability to talk. And when you look at NXT season one, um, I think, in my opinion, I won the series when I did, uh, we did a, something called a Talk the Talk Challenge and they gave us a, a random word. We had to try and make a promo on the fly of it in front of, you know, millions watching and, and about 10,000 people in the building. And uh, I did a Winds of Change pro. I was in the word wind and I did, did the winds of change promo. So I think that's ultimately what won me the show. And I think people saw that in management and thought, wow, this guy can actually do some stuff. He's confident enough to pull this off despite his obvious lack of experience. I think one of the biggest issues and one of the hardest things to transition to for me was that in developmental um, and indeed on NXT season one, I barely had a match longer than six minutes in my entire time in developmental or, or NXT season one. The matches were all very short. We had... 60 people in the developmental class and we had one or maybe two shows a week so they would have to pack as you know 13 matches on a show and we'd all get six minutes or something so to go from that to suddenly being no you're now in the main event and you're wrestling john cena for 25 30 minutes or you're wrestling randy orton i hadn't had that level of experience of putting long matches together at that point in my career so that was probably the hardest thing i found in terms of the the promo work and and the character work i was always very comfortable with that but the the biggest jump was to go to suddenly these long main event matches and, and trying to pull that off last week was actually the 10th anniversary of nexus the the debut where you tore apart the ring looking back on that 
what do you, what do you think was the biggest strength of the group and why do you think it, you know, didn't ultimately work out? I think the, the biggest strength was the shock factor of that, um, that day we attacked the ring. I think there was a level of believability to it. And I think after we had done the attack and ripped the ring apart and beat up John Cena, we came to the back as a group and they were showing on the WWE programming at that point, just the carnage in the ring. And then they were showing the looks of the people in the crowd there. And there was a combination of both shock and fear on the faces of the crowd. And it's very rarely that you can get that level of visceral, real reaction from a fan base. Um, and uh, I think that's where, that's why people still talk about it to this day. It was so shocking. It was so unbelievable. It's very hard to make those moments happen in pro wrestling because let's face it, there's WWE alone are pumping out 10 plus hours a week of wrestling content. And then you've got AEW doing another four or something and, and everything else. So we've all seen everything now. It's very hard to get something new. So when that does happen, it really is magic and it's lightning in a bottle. And in terms of it falling apart, um, I don't think... Storyline wise, it was necessarily the right thing to do to have us lose at SummerSlam, for example. Um, I don't think it necessarily had the support of certain people in management or certain people writing the show that it would have needed to have to have lasted as longer than it did. Um, but in terms of a, a shocking moment, it was one of the one of the greatest of in recent memory, I think. And we'll always have that, and I think st people still love talking about it to this day. And I know over the years, people have asked about you know different reunions and. Uh, I'm trying to think of who. I know they did the Chikara Trios tournament. I think it was Tarver, Young, and one of the other guys, uh, PJ Black. And I think there was a a rumor about you guys getting together for something for WrestleMania this year. Like I was contacted in January or February by uh, someone at WWE about potentially doing something over the WrestleMania period. I didn't like the idea. Um, so to me, it didn't have any legs. I know they were planning to do something um, because I spoke to Darren Young just after I'd had my phone call. I bumped into Darren Young, had a chat with him, and uh, he told me he was he was going to be involved in something. I think that's why everyone knows about it now. Darren spoke about it on his podcast, I think. So uh, he was going to do something, but I wasn't going to be involved this time. Do you follow the current WWE product at all? I don't. I can't say I tune in every week and watch it. I think by virtue of the fact that I've got a ton of friends there who I speak to regularly um, and the fact that we're all so connected on you know, Twitter and social media and Instagram and stuff, you can't help but not know what's going on. I speak to Drew Galloway regularly. Uh, Drew McIntyre, I should say, is his current branding. Um, I'm obviously thrilled for him that he's... WWE champion, and he's doing a great job. But for the most part, I just, you know, I'm I'm aware of what's going on, but I'm not I'm not tuning in regularly. The same with AEW, I'm not tuning in regularly to that, but I'm aware of the main storylines. I'm aware when certain guys are debuting and, and big moments and things like that, and I can keep up with it. But um, I just don't have the time in my day to sit and watch the volume of, of wrestling that's getting pumped out at this point in life. I've, I've got other things going on right now, and Obviously, I keep up to date with all the NWA stuff that I'm involved in and make sure I check out their programming. And I would encourage anyone to do so. It's a little quirky. It's a little different. But um, I, I love it. It's very much storyline and narrative-based and character-based pro wrestling, which is the kind of wrestling that I love. I was just curious because as a fellow King, I wanted to ask if you had any thoughts on King Corbin, the most recent King of the Ring winner. Uh, you know what? I've known Cor Corbin for... I guess six or seven years. I remember meeting him in a gym in Florida once and he, he was pretty new at that point. I think he came in from the NFL and he'd, uh, he'd asked me a bit of advice about working as a bigger guy and, you know, some problems he was having as he was learning. So I've, I've had him on my radar for a long time. I think he's fantastic. I truly do. I haven't seen much of the King character that he's portraying, but him as a performer, he's legitimate. He's big. He's athletic. He could kick everyone in the audience's ass. And I think the world of pro wrestling would be a lot better off with more Baron Corbin types in there in general. Um, in terms of the King character he's portraying, like I say, I haven't seen too much of it, but I will say from my own experiences, any character you're given, whether it's the King or anything else, is only ever going to be as good as the writing that goes behind it. So if he's getting good writing, then it's going to be a success. But if he's, if he's being treated as an afterthought, then it's, it's going to struggle. I think that was my issue when I was King Barrett that uh, I felt like the, the creative side of things were lacking. Getting back to the, the world of NWA and Carnyland, it's been very fun to watch 
it's almost in an unfortunate situation. We're all going through it, but you know, the NWA adapted, brought this idea and now we're, you know, watching a mayoral election unfold. Who's your front runner for mayor? You know, it's difficult to call and um, I'm a little concerned because I'm the narrator. I'm this kind of godlike voice that descends upon Carney Island. I'm a bit concerned that my power is going to be diminished, whoever the mayor may be. So I'm watching very closely. But I will say what I love about Carney Island is the fact that NWA have come out and said, look, we're not going to we're not going to have any shows. We're not going to risk fans safety or wrestlers safety during this pandemic till things clear up we will not be putting on any wrestling. So somehow we've got to keep the fans engaged. We have to keep the creative minds of the wrestlers who are employed by NWA uh, flowing. And this is a great opportunity to work on character development and some craziness and hopefully entertain people in the, the meantime and try something different uh, given the limitations that we have. So uh, I, I think it's, it's very quirky. Go into it with an open mind. It's not going to be like anything you've ever seen before, but, but definitely check it out. And I hope at the end of this, um, that there's a character developed on Carneyland who goes on to progress to the NWA Power TV show, which is basically what happened with me and Bad News Barrett. I was created on a show called the JBL and Cole Show, which was running at the time. It was an internet show on, on WWE.com, and my character on there, Bad News Barrett, took off so well that it actually migrated from this quirky show onto the real programming and, and became a very successful part of my career. Um, so I'm hoping somebody on Carneyland gets that kind of traction um, and people buy into it and, and maybe it's an Alison Kay or a Tim Storm or whoever else, but this is a new arc for your character and it's a chance to do something you, under normal circumstances when you're in this treadmill of pro wrestling, you don't get a chance to explore. And now you've got a chance with a completely blank canvas to explore the most wild thing imaginable. And you know what? If it doesn't work, we've lost nothing. We just move on and we erase it out of Carneyland, you can try something else. So it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity for young wrestlers with personalities and characters that they want to try out. Give it a shot now. I don't think you can put it any better than that. You know, it's an opportunity for somebody. If it doesn't work, change it. But you have firsthand experience of how you can turn a character into that that was meant to be a bit role and build it into something bigger and better. So there you go. I'll get you out on this. Uh, when the whole pandemic started, uh, people were worried about having content to watch. Obviously, Carneyland is one of those things that came out of it, but uh, I've been doing a feature called The Watch List, asking all the people I talk to, you know, favorite matches, recommendations, anything that really catches your eye. So is there anything from your own career that, you know, really you feel like represents you as a professional wrestler, or is there another match that, you know, you just saw recently that, you know, there's a real talent that caught your eye is there somebody on power that you know people really haven't caught on with yet yeah well i'm my own biggest critic so i don't think there's ever been a match or a performance that i've ever done in anything that i've been 100 percent happy with so i'm not going to put forward anything of my own here but i will say there was a match from earlier this year i was commentating on it it was from a nwa pay-per-view show called hard times um, and the match was for the NWA Women's Championship. It was Alison Kay versus Thunder Rosa. And in my eyes, it's the best match I've seen in years. It is absolutely superb. I know there's going to be a lot of people listening to this who perhaps aren't as familiar with Alison Kay and Thunder Rosa as they could be because they haven't worked with WWE. I promise you, if you can go track this match down, um, it is superb. It has everything. They're, they're fantastic. And I think it's a shining example of how far women's wrestling has come over the last few years from how people of my generation really remember women's wrestling and, and how it was treated to come to that now they were phenomenal and um, the pair of them just deserve so much credit for that and i think in my eyes that's going to be right up there when people do their end of year best matches of 2020 kind of thing that one has to be in there if people are going to get eyes on nwa and include nwa which they should um, that match has to be in there. So Alison Kay versus Thunder Rosa for the NWA Women's Championship at hard times earlier this year. I've seen Thunder Rosa work a few different places. Same with Alison Kay, but uh, speaking about her, I, I saw her work the last Josh Barnett's Bloodsport. They're, they're, they're both really tough, and that was a really, yeah. really good match. So. They're tough lady, and, and um, I think there's – historically been a notion that the women's matches aren't as brutal or aren't as tough or aren't as technically sound as the men and that is the 
this this match is the retort to any claim anyone can say about that. It's it's absolutely superb. It's got everything you'd ever want from a major high profile championship match. And absolutely superb. Both women were fantastic in it, and yeah, definitely check it out. All right, Stu Bennett, I am Vengeance Retaliation. It's out this Friday. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show.